This is Raymond Trevery. You're listening to Metal Warning. Raymond Herrera, the man, the myth, the legendary human drum machine. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to Metal Wine today. That's a very kind introduction. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, first off, um, I wonder what's going on in the Archaea camp. Any plans for new material, live performance, or anything in the near, near future? No, probably not. Um, I started writing some stuff with Christian, um, and then he got into a really bad motorcycle accident. Ooh, and then, um, so everything kind of ended up stalling for a bit. Um, in the meantime, I've been putting this other project together with, uh, with a bunch of different friends from different bands. It's called Project Rogue. Mm. Um, so I've been, that's kind of been the, the last thing I've been working on. But no, there, there's no, uh, there's no plans, uh, to do anything else with our kids. Um, I mean, I don't know if that'll change in the future, but, you know, at least it's for the moment. No, very cool, very cool. Well, just on the Archaea topic for the moment, um, when you were working with Archaea, uh, Threat Signal's earlier work, <clears throat> it was very yeah. very similar fear to, uh, feel to Fear Factory. So what was the chemistry like, uh, you know, between Christian, yourself, Pat Cavanaugh, and John Howe when you guys were first jamming together? Well, Christian, Christian produced uh, the uh, Threat Signal second album, so that's, that's when they kind of became close. And um, when Christian and I had uh, had started writing music, um, uh, Christian it was Christian's idea to essentially work with John, and you know do a new project with John. So it all kind of that's how it started. Then eventually we just ended up ended up adding the uh, uh, the project too. But but yeah, it basically started with Christian and myself, and then John coming into the picture, um, and then Pat coming in afterwards. So a lot of the stuff was already written by Christian and myself. Um, and then John came in and started, you know, rewriting some parts and, cause you know, John's actually, he's actually a pretty good, uh, drum programmer and he's a pretty good guitar player. So, so yeah, he kind of came in and rounded it all out a little bit. So, but, you know, being that he was such a huge fan, it was pretty simple to kind of, you know, have all the music come together creatively. Definitely. And it worked out in you guys' favor. Now, um, the album that you guys made with Archaea, that was all, um, all stuff that was meant meant to be Fear Factory stuff? Uh, yeah, we had written about eight songs, um, and then we ended up obviously changing them after after John kind of came into the picture because of its, you know, his vocal style was a little different. Um, but yeah, it originally started out as it was going to be the next Fear Factory album. Um, so, and then we, uh, I think we wrote another five songs after that um, that were meant, for, you know, for our kids. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah. Oh, very cool, very cool. So the Project Robe album. Now you guys, um, you guys wanted to collaborate with a big number of um, you know basic metal superstars. Now have you guys uh, managed to pull that off? What's the biggest thing that you want to achieve uh, for yourself or for the fans through Project Rogue's music? Well, on Project Rogue, I mean we're going a little different route, right? So we're going the crowdfunding route. So essentially, deal direct or work direct with the fans. So the fans will get to essentially dictate, like, which members they want to work together, uh, maybe different different outcomes of different songs, maybe we'll uh, have fans essentially be more in control of what we're doing along with us, rather than, you know, just putting an album out and be like, okay, here, what do you think after the fact? Um, so, that, I mean, that's the, it's more interactive element is what we're really looking to do, you know, to do something different. Um, but, yeah, you know, it's... Uh, it's a bunch of different friends from different bands, people I've known for the past two decades, um, at least most of them. So, so yeah, and, and, and most of them haven't, haven't worked with one another either. So as long as we've all known each other from different bands, we've just never really had the chance to work together. So, you know, in a sense, we're all fans of each other, and so, you know, haven't really worked at this level. So, yeah, it'll be, it'll, it, it should be pretty interesting. You know, I've done, um, I've done collaborations in the past, uh, for the video game world. Um, I've worked on a lot of video game projects over the years and that's how I was able to collaborate with some of my friends in the past. So now we get to do it on an album format. So mm. that's what makes it a little bit different. But the actual, you know, going through the process of, of writing with other people and working with them because they're on tour and all of that. I mean, I've done that in the past, so that's not really going to be new. Yeah. So 
like as far as the pro- the crowdfunding uh, aspect of it goes, um, now I've heard that you guys have had a little bit of a rough start with the Indie Indiegogo campaign. Um, so has that yeah. at all changed your view on the whole crowd crowdfunding thing? Or no, not necessarily. Um, you know, we're actually we're in talks with Pledge Music. We've been in talks with Pledge Music for close to a month now. Uh, we're getting ready to launch one on that. Um, I'm not necessarily turned off by it, but, you know, obviously, you know, we're trying to do something a little different, and I think it's taken a while for people to kind of wrap their head around it. I did get a lot of messages after we closed out the Indiegogo campaign of people saying, I didn't even know about this. I just heard about this the other day. Is there a way I can still pledge on it or, you know, that I can still, um, you know, uh, put funds into it? And so so that it seems like it's, it's almost a little late. Coming, uh, you know, somebody else was telling me that because most of our fans uh, or most of the people that would be on uh, these uh, crowdfunding websites are usually off for, for summer school or for summer um, and just kind of now getting back on their computers and, you know, things like that. And so I, I hadn't really thought about that, but who knows? <laughs> so, yeah, I, yeah, I've been told that certain projects are not good to do during the summertime because, you know, so, uh, yeah, so it, it, it's, a, it's been a learning process. I had never done one before. This was my first one. Um, I probably spent it for about maybe six, seven months. So I think hindsight, you know, there's probably a few things I would have changed because we're not just talking about doing an album. We're talking about doing uh, a very vast behind the scenes, almost like documentary movie style, where we go into each different person, how they got started, their first album. You know, for instance, we have a clip of Sean Reinhardt talking about uh, the first time he recorded on, on the Death Human album. That was the first time he ever recorded in the studio. And so we went into kind of a discussion of that, and we've got like a two-minute edit of that. But that goes on for a long time, and he kind of goes into, you know, his preparation, what he had to go through mentally and all this stuff. So, I mean, there's a lot more that I wanted to do with this, and I'm thinking one of the problems must, might have been that I think it was just too much for people to understand all at once. We should have maybe just started with an album, maybe an EP, mm-hmm. then an album, then maybe a full DVD kind of thing, behind the scenes footage, so on and so forth. So I think I think one of the problems is I might have tried to pack too many things into this first one, and I think it was just too much for people to comprehend, mm. you know? But yeah. but it's okay. I mean, that's fine, right? This is all part of the process. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. Sometimes you bite off more you can chew, but, you know, who would have known that crowdfunding was, uh, you know, a seasonal sport? <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly right. So, and you know, everybody's got different opinions. So, oh, you should have done this. You should have done that. You know, things like that. So, I mean, that's fine. That's fine. You know, I want the opinions. I want the critique because I mean, that's how we learn on, you know, what stuff works and what doesn't. So, so yeah. I mean, for the most part, people are excited about it. Um, you know, and if if, if um, you know, if we end up not getting what we need to do on the crowdfunding part, I mean, we can always go to a label and maybe go that route and you know essentially go the route of the, the normal way to go. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we'll see, though, you know? I mean, it's, it's definitely an interesting project, and everybody in it is very happy about it. So, hold on really quick. I'm getting excited just talking about it. So, um, you um, mentioned your career as a uh, composer for uh, video games. Now. What's the biggest difference between, you know, the process of making, yeah. um, you know, music, um, like is a traditional rock or metal album, and, and doing the whole video game thing? Well, yeah, it's completely different. It's completely different on many scenarios. Um, in some cases, in some cases, you're not even writing songs. You're just writing musical pieces, right? So you only like to do like a six or seven minute piece of music. So there's no verse, there's no intro, no chorus. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes you have to write with an orchestra. And let's say you have the orchestral musical parts. And then we'll write our rock elements over that. So, I mean, we would technically just be writing over orchestral music. Um, and then, you know, so, and then if, if, it's, uh, if it's an interactive part, let's say, um, actually, we, we ended up doing this with Iron Man, with the Iron Man 3 game, where you have a piece of music that's more while you're in the intro mode, and then when you go to boss mode, then you have to kind of step up the music. So, it's still the same music, but more, uh, more aggressive, maybe faster, you know, things like that. Um, so it really depends on the game. I mean, some games, you have to write musical pieces. Um, you know, more games like, you know, like uh, for instance, your racing games and things like that, you can just write regular songs. You can actually write, you know, intro, verse, chorus, you know, so on and so forth. So it, it really depends on the project for the most part. Hmm. Very cool. What, um, what would 
you say is the most metal game that you guys have worked on? Uh, you know, Mortal Kombat, Carmageddon, Resident Evil. You've done so many of them. Probably there was a game that we did uh, that we worked on back in the day. It was it was called Demolition Racer? I think it was for the PS One. Mm-hmm. That was probably the most because we were able. To, we were essentially just writing what we write, like a lot of Fear Factory style. So we wrote it more in that form. So, so yeah, I mean, that was probably the most. Because, you know, a lot of the other ones, like, they'll be like, okay, well, we need another, you know, like, fun songs and maybe, like, a heavy rock song. And so, yeah, I mean, Demolition Racer, we were able to just kind of write what we love to write. So I would say that one. I guess, um, you know, rather than tiptoe around it, we should just address the industrial elephant in the room here, which is, uh, which is Fear Factory. And have you uh, been following the new music since Mechanize? And, you know, what's your opinion on that? Um, I thought Mechanized was really good, actually. I thought Gene did a great job. It was probably a little too thrashy for me, but for the most part, I think that from the interviews, it sounded like they were trying to kind of recapture the demanufacturer feel. So I think they kind of did a pretty good sound. Uh, I think they did a pretty good job doing that. Um, Mechanized, I didn't like at all. Um, I was really surprised that they used the drum machine um, because I actually have thought about something like that back when we did Archetype. Um, You know, I played around with the idea of possibly trying to record or do the album on a drum machine rather than me having to play it. But every time we did it, it came out really, really stale. And, you know, our demos were always with drum machines, but it always sounded incredibly stale. And so I think that's... I would have loved to hear Gene on that record. I think it would have been way better. Mm -hmm. Um, So... uh, yeah, but, um, yeah, so I, I, I don't know if that's so much came up in the room. I mean, a lot of people ask me about that. But, you know, I, I think Mechanized was a good record. Uh, Industrialist, I, I really didn't care for it. I was, I was really I, w- I was really surprised that they would have gone the coaching route. Because, like I said, we tried to do that like 12 years ago, and it didn't sound very good. Um, we were able to come up with a couple of workarounds, but, I mean, at the end of the day, it just doesn't sound the same. It just doesn't feel the same. Unfortunately, I wish it did because it would have been a lot easier for me over the years than have to learn all the stuff that I would program. I mean, originally, most of the Fear Factory drum parts that I wrote were programmed on a drum machine. Then I had to learn them. Then I had to play them live. Mm-hmm. Right? So it would have been way easier for me to just program everything and not have to learn it and not have to play it. Oh, yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, you know, they kind of cut a lot of corners doing that. And, you know, I think there's been a lot of backlash about it, too. It just mm-hmm. makes for an easier recording because you don't have to deal with setting up drums, getting drum sounds, you know, your compressions on your mics. Uh, you don't have to worry about editing, like any of that stuff. So, I mean, it saves you a lot of time and a lot of money, but it doesn't sound very good, unfortunately. Like I said, you know, I've, I've tried to do that a long time ago. So, um, especially when you start to play a lot of the faster stuff, you play really slow, like more one-two beats and more rock stuff, you can get away with doing a drum machine because it's not as noticeable, but if you start playing faster, it's very, very noticeable. That makes sense. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, there are many metal uh, drummers out there who try to tend to stick to the organic techniques and avoid the drum triggers and samples as much as possible nowadays. But since you really kind of pioneered uh, the use of that stuff with Fear Factory's music, um, what do you yeah. think is, like, really their place in, um, you know, modern heavy metal right now? Um, I mean... You know, there's a lot that you can do. I mean, you can record live drums and then and then and then uh, replace all the sounds. So I mean, you have a lot of different options now that we didn't have back when you know, you know, our first record, 1995. There was no Pro Tools, right? Everything was on two inch tape. Um, and even when we did the manufacture, that was all on two inch tape too. Um, so I mean, there's just a lot more options now. Um, you don't have to be as good because you can just sound replace everything, and you can just kind of you know, <laughs> essentially sequence everything. Um, so, I mean, you know, just like with vocals, I mean, for a long time, you didn't have to really, you know, you, you didn't have to actually be a good singer to be something in the studio. So, I mean, it's just become the same with drums and, you know, possibly with everything else. So, um, you know, it, it, that, that's the unfortunate part of it. But, you know, if you're really good and you're skilled, there are a lot of tools at your arsenal. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I mean, there's ways to cheat if you want to cheat. You know, obviously, industrialists is, proof of that. If you want to cheat, you can cheat. Um, you know, but if, if you want to do something that sounds really killer, you can make something sound amazing in a third of the time that it would have taken maybe 15 years ago. So, I mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of great tools out there to make you sound really good. 
even if you are really good, it allows you to do them in a third of the time. So, I mean, it just depends. It depends on who you ask, right? You can ask 10 different people what they think about technology and how they use in music. You'll get 10 completely different answers. Um, you know, my, I've always embraced it. I mean, you know, I tried to use the drum machines about as, you know, as early as I could. And I remember a lot of my friends that are, you know, drummers, they, you know, they always looked at drum machines as like the devil. And I always thought the drum machines were incredibly convenient. What other way could I like killer drum beats at three in the morning with my headphones on? I couldn't do that on the drum kit. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I mean, there's a lot of advantages to using tools, but once again, you know, if you're using the tools because you're not good enough to do it, well, then I guess that's a whole different situation entirely, right? Um, so, I mean, I guess that, that's kind of my take on it, you know? Your, de- your drumming was definitely essential in creating the Fear Factory signature sound. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you developed your machine-like drumming technique that, you know, is so unique as compared to the tip- typical uh, extreme metal double bass and blast beats? Sure. So, yeah. So, I mean, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I was listening to Lars and Dave and, you know, Gene Hoagland and all these guys. And what I noticed is everybody was kind of doing this one, two fast beat and then, you know, tom rolls and, you know, and the guitars were always doing these triplet, you know, these triplet pickings and all this other, you know, intuitive rhythms. And I always thought, well, wouldn't it be cool to kind of create drum beats and follow those riffs like that? And so that's kind of how I kind of, drumming style, so I just concentrated more on kick drums and, um, and you know, coming up with different rudiments and patterns and eventually turning it into the sound that I guess everybody knows and loves after that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's essentially how it started. And when I started working with Dino, one of the things I liked about Dino is he didn't play guitar solos. He, he hated guitar solos. And, you know, growing up in L.A., every guitar player I knew loved doing guitar solos. So when I, when I met Dino, we were like, okay, yeah, so he just likes to riff, and, you know, he doesn't want to do solo. So, so yeah, it was a great match. It was a great match. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, so, I mean, you know, besides the Fear Factory stuff, I think the only record I had heard before that that didn't have guitar solos was a band called Terrorizer. They had a record called World Downfall. Mm-hmm. And I always loved that album, and it didn't need guitar solos. So, I mean, yeah, so, you know, we came in and we started this band, and, you know, we had the keyboards, we got rid of guitar solos, our, our singer didn't just, growl he was singing so we had a few different elements to you know the metal that we all kind of grew up listening to and so i mean you know talk about backlash we had a ton of backlash when we started beer Vector. um i was still in high school when we were doing the band and a lot of my friends didn't like the band at all because to them we were not metal we weren't a metal band mm-hmm. so even though we were heavy and all these things the elements that we added to the band were were in, in their eyes not metal, they're not metal enough. So they're like, okay, well then we're not metal. <laughs> so you know, we just kind of embraced it. We're like, screw it, we're just going to do what we want to do. Absolutely, it worked out. It worked out best, uh, very well for everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Here's a million dollar question for you. Um, do you or Christian ever, you know, see yourselves being able to work with Dino and Burton to do another Fear Factory album together? Um, I, mean, I don't see that happening. I mean, I, I doubt it. I don't think that would happen. I think there's uh, too much, uh, how can I say, there's too much water under that bridge. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, who knows? I mean, I guess you can never say never, right? But, I mean, there are no plans to do that, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, you can know. Imagine, I can imagine <laughs> that with all the <laughs> history. But, um, yeah. So do you have any uh, any? kind of message that you'd like to send out to all your fans around the world? Um, well, I don't know. That's pretty tall order. I mean, I, I guess, I, you know, the one message I would I would say is um, I definitely want people to kind of look out for this Project Road project because I think it's going to be it's going to be a pretty interesting project. You know, we haven't... Um, there's been similar projects like this on... I think Roadrunner did Roadrunner United. Mm-hmm which was kind of taking, I mean, it's, I, I guess, somewhat, somewhat of a similar idea, but obviously we're not limited to taking all the artists from just one band, I mean, just one label. Mm-hmm. You know, we're able to kind of just bring in whoever we want to bring in, essentially, or whoever would be interested. So, I mean, we plan to grow this thing larger. You know, I know we've got a lot of artists, and we plan to add a lot more. And so I definitely want people to kind of keep an eye on it because um, I think it's going to be really interesting. You know, they'll get to see a lot of their probably favorite musicians working with some of their other favorite musicians and should make for pretty interesting uh, music. That's for sure. Okay, I know I'm going to be watching out for that one. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, so, you know, I got to say thank you um, for taking the time to talk to us. Again, it, it's been an absolute honor being able to chat with you for a little while. Um, 